Hello, David Zritsky for The Bond Experience. Welcome back. Look who I am joined by live, no less. Sidorat and Lillard, thank you so much for coming. You're so welcome. Oh my gosh, you are, wait, hold on a second. You're live and in person. Oh my God, that's so weird, right? Isn't it weird? Especially given the history of everything to do with this film. <laughs> well, it's yeah. true, and we're gonna get into that, but the last time we talked, there was a screen in between us. We still had a wonderful time, conversation. My audience absolutely loved it, but they wanted more. <laughs> <laughs> and you were so gracious, you said, you know what, let's meet at a place in New York. We're here at Dear Irving. It's kind of bondish, right? So, yeah, it's great. I mean, you guys can't see the whole thing, but it, I was, it was very impressive walking in. And the view in front of us is incredible. It really feels like if there were a Bond villain based in Manhattan, this would be their lair. I, I yeah. agree. We, we'll have to keep our eyes open yeah. a little bit. <laughs> so, so this is an evolution. I mean, just even being in front of each other. but. There's been a bit of an evolution since the last time we spoke because you've launched a couple of projects that you had been working on, uh, Macbeth, and a really small independent TV show called Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> How have those gone? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm recovering from both of those things at the moment. Uh, yeah, the Obi-Wan is, I think there's a couple of, maybe one episode left to air. One, yeah. Um, so yeah, similarly, like the world and universe of Bond, there's quite a lot of frisson about yeah. it in the world. Um, a huge fan base, not unlike a Bond fan base, rabid fans. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's quite a that's a, a thing where when you finish a really intense project, and you think you can kind of, you know, I don't want to say it in a negative way, like rid yourself of it, but just you know take a breath and kind of be in a little bit of a bubble like you can't get away from when the bomb film comes out or when Obi-Wan comes out so it's all yeah, encompassing it's, it's everywhere yeah it's everywhere um, but yeah no it's been really lovely because people that I interact with you know whether they're friends or acquaintances or various business things always there's somebody who wants to know something about Obi-Wan and a lot of kids. That's the that's the difference, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with the sort of Bond fan base and the there, I've had so many great interactions with people's kids oh. about Obi Wan, which is really that reminds you kind of also. It sort of renews the enthusiasm of why you do things, and they they observe. Th I mean, Bond fans really observe things. To the you stitch, think? <laughs> to the stitch, yeah. but like the you know, but the kids like you know recreating costumes and things already oh. from sending me pictures of things, you know, friends, nephews, and nieces, and sons, and daughters. Yeah, it's great. Oh my gosh. Now, which one, it, it, is it Star Wars or James Bond has more pressure? Do they have similar pressure? Um, they're both big. They're, <laughs> yeah, I think big is not a big enough word yeah, for what they right. are. Um, I think for me, I try to, in a way, I have to tune out how massive they are in order to be serious and faithful about my duty to each of those things I kind of have to look at it like in digestible chunks mm. as I'm doing it so it's only after that you kind of walk into an event or you know you're at a, a, um, a kiosk or a newsstand and like every magazine cover is that thing or you know or obviously the internet but um, so uh, yeah they're they're both big um, I think maybe the Star Wars stuff has, because of the sort of kid component, right? Um, maybe just feels slightly different in its bigness. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. It does. Because yeah. I, I tell you, I was watching Kenobi just like when I was watching No Time to Die, thinking, uh, trying to walk in your shoes. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I came away with is there's seems I'm sure there are restrictions like Disney, Lucasfilm, etc. Has certain you know Obi Wan wouldn't wear. Um, a, a lace frock, you know, a see-through lace frock or a lingerie, as James Bond wouldn't wear an orange tuxedo with ruffles. Yeah. So, not we, yet at least. Not yet. It's coming in yeah. Bond 26. Look you for heard it. it here. Yeah, exactly. It's an exclusive. No, but I, I, I came away thinking, and this was a question I wanted to ask you, with Eon and Dan Jack, you know, when you first get engaged with them, do they give you a list of restrictions? What can Bond wear? What can't he wear? Um, Absolutely not. They don't give you restrictions. Uh, working with Eon is an absolute dream. Uh, 
they're very um, obviously proud of their legacy and their brand partnerships and the history built with, you know, like chiseled in stone. Well, not chiseled, but like really, really carved in stone, set in stone. So I'm mixing all my metaphors today. I like it. Uh, By the way, I do that, so we're, we're <laughs> doubly guilty. Um, but no, they were, they, what they did do was offer up what the partnerships have historically been and offer them up as a kind of like, if you want to go down this path, we can shepherd that for you. Um, but throughout, the remit was always authenticity to what mm -hmm. our story was. So um, even a brand that was a sort of long-standing partner might, you know, like with the, for instance, with the NPL partnership, yeah. um, I knew that that jumper at the end which I wanted to do, and we knew we needed most because we could never find, like, there were enough, um, uh, there were enough customizations and mm. to not use an existing one. Right. Obviously, everything kind of needs to be tailor-made for our bond. Absolutely. And so because I had already established a bit of a working relationship with MPL for some other pieces, I thought to myself, like, I wonder if they would do a cotton or a silk, something like light. Obviously, they do cashmere, so mm -hmm. because I had, you know, a bit of a rapport already, I was able to ask that, and I was, I was actually not sure about approaching them about that to begin right. with, um, but it obviously became an opportunity for both of us, and because they understood our timelines and our needs and the needs for multiples and the sort of like slight size run changes and mm -hmm. things for you know, stunt doubles and whatnot. Um, it was the perfect way to um, do that. But but yeah, so in that regard, Eon sort of gives you the palette and the tools, right. but they don't demand that you use them. And they're happy when you do, sure. and really supportive, obviously, but I never at, at all felt like it was a, an edict of any kind. That's so great to hear that you yeah. had that sort of, I'll just say it, carte blanche. Because you, and I've said this to you on, on the last discussion, I see you as an artist in really kind of painting and weaving, excuse the pun, all the different aspects and bringing the character out through the wardrobe. So if you're restricted in some way too much, I mean, obviously, Obi-Wan Kenobi should eventually wear some sort of Jedi robe, etc. But the fact that with Bond, you can kind of see the palette of brands, but you also went off the reservation, so to speak, um, as well. So. When you make those choices, I mean, do you think to yourself, I need to walk down a street on Savile Row and just kind of look around? What's that process? Yeah, no, I mean, some of it is obviously being someone who, outside of my career, is obsessed with clothing and have my own, um, you know, in my free time, I'm shopping, for, even if it's just window shopping. I just, I kind of want to know what's going on. You right. know, there was a, a period where, um, you know, where we were changing directors and period I took the time to kind of I was like, okay, I'm really gonna study what's coming out what's happening out in the world of mm -hmm. menswear and women's wear um, and you know I went to every major place that I thought would be instinctually right and sometimes not just seeing what people were doing you know right. just taking it all in so that when an appropriate um, use for something might emerge because it was a new character or a new location or a new story point for Bond or any of the other characters, that I would have a little reserve, me and my team. Um, but you're right, like, it's just like anybody, you know, you just kind of collect things like a magpie in your head, like, right. you know, for instance, the tie um, that Bond wears in the Terra Oh, yes, tie. yeah. You know, that's, that's a store They're that, located right here in New York, too. Yeah, and, and that's a store that I go to quite frequently, personally. Right. Um, so when we were working out what that first look was going to be and we wanted to have a sort of romantic flair and we were discussing you know, just how formal or informal or casual or dressed up or whatever, um, you know, whatever adjectives were coming out in the conversation yeah. made me think, okay, I'm going to show, I'm going to, I'm going to see what they have right now on the website, loaded up the website, pulled up a few options and I was like, I feel like one of these could be really, you know, so it's, it's that, and that didn't come obviously from Eon or Gab Jack. No. It was just me because in my personal New York life, 
there are stores that I like to go in. And, um, you know, I, there's a couple of other things like that that were introduced into the film that way. On the flip side, um, you know, brands that weren't in the stable of brand partnerships that f felt very important by the end of the film, they would come to me and they would say, okay, so do you think you could pass on whatever information you have to us? We might approach them about starting a new partnership or something, you know, so it was very much, um, yeah, like they didn't, I wouldn't say there was a tangential relationship yes. and not one where they, you know, the fingers were in the pies. No, and I think yeah. for a lot of these brands, the ones that didn't have the established foundation of being Bond, like Connolly is a, is a great example. Connolly is featured relatively heavily in the film. There's yeah. at least two or three pieces and they came out um, through the partnership with Ian and Dan Jack with an entire line of James Bond oriented pieces, both um, inspired and paying homage to it. So for a brand, I would imagine, and, and I don't want to be vulgar about this, but it's a little bit of a jackpot to be associated with James Bond. Yeah, I mean, I, it definitely it definitely helps. Um, you know, you can't really reveal too much, and you don't want to get anybody's expectations up so high. And you also, what you don't want to do is have people pull out all the stops to provide you stuff, and then it doesn't make the final cut. You know, I just, I'm too sensitive for that to happen. So yes. you just kind of... You might drop a hint and, you know, because people are online all the time, they might see, oh, this designer came in and I see that she's working on the Bond film and they might then, through their own, you know, research, decide the next time I come in to be like, okay, well, here are like some extra goodies that aren't on the shop floor that you might want to look at, you know. Oh, but um, but uh, the other example of that is the Rogue Territory jacket. Yes. Um, which was truly like on a day off, and I went in because I wanted a pair of jeans for this little shop in London, and I was like, oh, that, I'm thinking about that scene, and I feel like maybe this jacket might be a good option. So anyways, it's, yeah, it, it just comes from all, everything. It's fantastic. Really. For and me, the, at least, yeah. Well, it, it's remarkable, something you said, I wanted to pause on it for a moment, just so everybody appreciates it. We're talking Bond, but there are so many characters. I mean, you are in yeah. charge, your team is in charge, of all of the different characters so do you have in your team do you assign them characters you know you have this person you have this person um in a way i guess like the chief bouncer is yes the the, the list of principal characters once we're kind of aware of what that is mm -hmm. and as time goes by you start to understand who on your team what their special superhero powers are and yes. you start to kind of weave together um, little mini teams to kind of execute, flesh out, contribute to, supervise, all that stuff, specific parts of production. Right. Somebody might have a really good um, penchant for, you know, women's wear and so there's an assistant designer that might be really good to put on that one. And it's not just that one character. I mean, everybody has way too much to do all the time. But, okay. it, um, you know, some of it is also based on, you know, where we would go in the world. You know, obviously, not the whole team could be in all the locations with this whole time. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, um, what do you call them? There are the away teams and the home <laughs> teams and, the, and the, the, the advanced team is what I was trying to think of. You know, some, some of the team could go ahead to Jamaica, set it up. Right. Some of the team had to stay back because right after Jamaica was, I can't remember what the order of things. Maybe it was oh, a so you had a forecast kind of where the people yeah, were. Yeah, so it was you know it's a huge logistics and Sarah Robinson, our amazing supervisor. I mean that's a large part of her um, main amazing like brain mapping right. is obviously to help me and the design team get what we need to do our work, but also to make sure that the, you know, she's like the, the logistician of everything, I on top that. of dealing with the budget, on top of making sure that the design is upheld, making sure, you know, like it's, it's it really is, uh, in some ways it's like, I had a friend from a long time ago who was a uh, film line producer, and she wanted to shift gear, she kind of had it with him, and she ended up working for um, Doctors Without Borders, and I asked me for a, a recommendation, and I 
found when I was writing what my experience with her being working in a remote foreign location, like setting up a whole infrastructure, mm. I was like, actually, you know what? Like these skills are totally transferable to that. You know, it's like setting up a mission to operate, setting up infrastructure, setting, you know, like all that stuff. So in the costume department, you have a mini version of that happening because we're the ones who know what our needs are gonna be. Like everything to setting up like how the background fittings are gonna go, mm -hmm. who are the people in that local country you're gonna to wanna to employ, who are gonna be the stitchers and the tailors and the people who can help us out doing that because you can't always bring the whole team. That makes sense. Yeah. But it, it also, it sounds like that logistics you know, person also allows you to be creative. So you don't have to get mired into the muck of yeah. those details. Yeah, thank God. Oh my gosh, it would be <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not always been like that, and obviously on a Bond film, you know, 60 years of doing this, there's a, a bit of a system. Right. Um, and obviously the system keeps having to change because the world is changing, but I would say it has to be a well-oiled machine. So um, there is, there, there's so much support from Barbara and Michael, you know, down yeah. um, to what all the crew needs to get the best result on everything, and so that people actually have a sort of humane life while doing it. Mm -hmm. um, starting out in little indie film, that's not always the case. I I yeah, know yeah. where you came yeah. from, my gosh, so. and then pulled through. But uh, I will say, um, not any longer an independent actor, Daniel Craig. Um, I spoke to him three times during the press junket, and by the third time, I think he realized, oh, this is the guy that's interested in clothing and accessories, because that's all I asked him, oh, right. was clothing and accessories. And actually, the very first time, so many people in the press junket, and of course they have to, the journalists, Variety, people like that, uh, Empire Magazine, they ask, what's your favorite gadget? Who's the next Bond? You know, they have this, I hate to say it, cliche of questions. Right. And then I come in there and say, what's your favorite suit from the movie? <laughs> You know, which one did you feel the most comfortable? He's like, this is fantastic. Because you know, he's a clothes oh, horse. He, lo yeah. he loves clothing. It's a but pleasure to work with someone like him for that reason. I yeah. would imagine. Yeah. But he called your name out many times as this wonderful partnership. Did you find the same that you could just oh, yeah. feed off I, of him? I, I'm, I, you know, for me, the clothing, I, I've said this a few times, and I, I forgive the, re the re repetition of it, but it's because it's true. For me, the clothing, in addition to sort of, on a Bond film, needing to be a sort of ambassador of the look, you know, and of the world, and very much like, you know, the visuals are hyper important. Um, they are also kind of an extension of the character behavior because our Bond, this version of it, was uh, so emotionally well-rounded, mm -hmm. maybe by comparison to other bonds, yeah. um, it the clothing really played a significant role, and like the, I feel like that's one of my fortes as a costume designer. Is like what what can I do to help create this character aside from making them this actor look amazing? Sure. Sometimes that's not the goal. Sometimes you really need to tell that emotional story. I don't know if you could imagine those early scenes in No Time to Die where he's just kind of like given up on. Him. Thing, but he's suited and booted in like you know a, a Savile Row special. It wouldn't make any sense right. for that journey. That first version of him being back to the bond we know and love has to come at a point where that's the, that's the light switch that goes on. He's yeah. like gone. He's got that suit. That bond is back. Right. You can't really start it out that way. So the remit of working with an actor like Daniel, who's so amazing, such an amazing actor, who really wants to express and feel those things that the character is going through, means that there, the conversation has to be quite, um, it's a, it's a two-way conversation. Yeah. It would be really, I think, difficult for someone who's, I mean, he's in every scene of the film, he has so much work to do on top of maintaining his physique, learning the stunts, you know, all the things that someone like him would be charged to do when he takes on a role like that. Um, he needs to be working with people he can trust to 
help that vision come true. So he can't be micromanaging all that. Having said that, of course, if something wasn't working, we would both actually, I think our tastes align so much. You know, we both might um, inject an idea or a, 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 an option into a conversation. Mm -hmm. The team would provide the option and it would go on and he, he would either tell by my face or I'd tell by his face and be like, yeah, we're taking that off, you know, <laughs> like, or yeah, no, actually wow. we need to do it. And we, you know, it was, it was quite good because if you're coming from the place of character and once you develop enough of a trust in this kind of conversation, in this right. back and forth, um, it makes my work so much more, like I want to do more and give it all, give it my all. Yeah. It makes it just, I think, just richer. You know? I know it's going back a ways, but do you remember anything that you had put on Bond that it changed dramatically in the final cut? jacket or top hat. Oh, yeah, it's going back quite a ways. I mean, sometimes uh, sometimes in the development of things we would I know, well, well here's one example is the, the combat travels or something. Mm. Like I always knew we were going to make them and I, I wanted them to be uh, based on and Daniel, I'd shown Daniel a picture of um, a vintage pair an actual, you know, historical pair, but they were from the 40s. Mm -hmm. So I, I already know, just from my knowledge of the history of clothing, the fit's going to be completely different. You know, the waist's going to be super high, the legs are going to be really wide. You know, it's not right. going to fit down on Craig in the yeah. way that we come to know how. Sleek. Yeah. So, but because it was such a key starting point for this thing, we went ahead and we recreated the vintage pair mm. for the fitting so that we could assess like what it was that we liked about it and what we and then we made actually I think I believe if I'm not mistaken we made three versions for that first time for the first fitting which is the first fitting you both a consummate actor like Daniel and myself and the cutting team tailors the assistants everybody knows that the answer is not going to be finalized it's, this is process. Right. This is like, these are the shapes we're going to explore so that everybody can take the notes on what to do for the next fitting. Maybe you get it in the second fitting, mm -hmm. but um, probably they would always take sort of three fittings. Um, at, you know, that was the kind of golden number, I think, um, for various reasons. But in that first fitting, when we were introducing the physical pants, that they have gone from picture form, sketch form, into like now physical, right. um, the muslin form. They were, um, you know, there was the hero, vintage, uh, forensic analysis version of it, which was, you know, all the details from that period. Right. Um, then there was a version that was hyper modern, like mm. more based on some of the trousers that I knew that we liked the fit of. Right. Probably too modern, and some of the details, kind of the proportions around. And when, once I worked that out, I was like, I think we need a third version which is kind of like somewhere in the middle of these things, where we take enough of the details of the, of the hero pair, the, right. the originating inspiration pair, and enough of the kind of style lines and cut features of this, and we sort of cross-pollinate them, we have this third pair. And he's so brilliant, he will try all of them on. Even if we go, if, if we picked number two first, and he's like, yeah, great, this is it. Let's just keep working on this, let's perfect this. Right. You know, be like, well, we did actually make these. He's like, oh, let's try them on. You know, he's oh like gosh. game for it. So um, he wants to see all the options. Yeah, and all, in, in a fitting like that, we'll also do things like um, just because I know he cares and he enjoys this part of it. We like to like so he'll walk in and you know there would or and this is for any actor really. Isn't just, this is not just Daniel, but I love that he responds to it in this way. Um, it's really positive way. You know, the sketches will be up, the reference images will be up, even maybe other reference extant pairs that mm -hmm. we found in the world are muslin versions, and then dye samples of, you know, the colors we're thinking of. So it ranged, I think we were debating between like a charcoal gray all the way to like a really blue blue, and then, you know, nine things in between. And the ager dyer, aging dyeing team, the textile artist team, Sarah, 
she has recipes for all these things. So she'll label all the swatches like A through K. And like in her workshop, which is a massive workshop, right. she has all the formulas for it, getting those dye colors. I mean, it's like a whole. It's amazing. Yeah, and you know, thread colors and like the, the assistant designers, um, of which you know Michael Mooney was my immediate right hand associate, um, but we had Kristen and Ava, who basically, whatever character builds they were supervising. They would then flesh out other things. Like, okay, so Sutirat, here's seven button options just for that thigh pocket. And here are the ones for the top of the trouser, the waist. And here are some um, tapes for the inside of the, you know, all the details are um, laid out. Because, you know, and I know that Daniel personally likes all these things. So we, it's like walking into a boutique, you know, of and seeing it all like yeah. that. Um, some actors are not as interested in all of that, right. so we don't indulge in the kind of buffet of all the things. But um, and some are. Some really like to know that, like, wow, you really considered everything. You yeah. Know? Um, so yeah, it's 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 always a big getting ready for a, mm -hmm. a first fitting like that where you're making something um, is always a it's a bit of a production. It has to be. Yeah. Is it? So I, I wasn't even going to ask this, but it just conjured up in your description of this. Is it directly proportional to how much screen time? For example, those pants, they see a lot of screen time. As opposed to the RGT jacket, it's nine seconds on screen. We don't know that going in, how okay. long it's going to be on screen. That's true. And actually, there's a little, I think I told you this before, there's a little backstory to that jacket, which was, there was another um, sort of subtext to that jacket which is like how does he make it back from um, Cuba Cuba yeah. thank you of course <laughs> I'm like it's, it's been some time yeah, yeah. <laughs> how does he make it back from Tatooine? this is why you have a geek <laughs> next to you for those answers um, but uh yeah how does he make it back from being you know a wash in the ocean yeah to his garage in London with all these beautiful top forward suits and things and uh the idea was that he stole away, you know, he was picked up by some passing ship, and we actually, I, th I think we, sh I feel like we shot some version that telegraphed a little bit of this backstory. In the final cut, you never know what's going to end up there. Right, right. Um, luckily, I feel like that look works regardless, because you just have to imagine he's got to get from point A to B, and he's got to look a little bit like an everyman mm -hmm. before he becomes the superhero James Bond. It's, it's right? perfect so, because it seems like yeah. it's a barge, giant barge ship that picks him up. It's a trucker yeah. jacket, it's jeans, and it's a white t-shirt. It's like something that easily somebody on the ship could have had or would, like a closet of, you know, like when you go into a construction site and if you, even if you nicked that stuff yourself, yeah. it's like people's personal you know, jean jackets or whatever. You Absolutely. Know? So, no, it makes sense. Um, so I'm sorry, I think I've strayed off course. No, but it, but wonderfully, because it, I mean, th what I love about this is the sartorial kit that you chose has to work logically in the story itself. It has to, it can't be like all of a sudden shows up in a velvet Tom Ford tuxedo coming off of that ship. It's like, where did that even come from? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, all right, we talked about the palette. We talked about Eon. Um, I'm wearing something. You may have noticed. Oh, yes. Yeah, we're yeah. familiar. The No Time to Die watch from Omega. Is this a situation that you were able to get involved with the look of it? I know Daniel had oh, some fun. Yeah, absolutely. Daniel would have. I think that all because of the lead time and producing something that special and, right. and essentially the craft of watchmaking is a different, operates on a different timeline than clothing. Right. Um, so that was already underway when I joined. I was shown the things mm -hmm. um, and, you know, always like we were in charge of the watches as the, as the costume department. And I remember like it was kind of being finalized. There were some decisions that were left to made like on the strap. And I think a lot of the, um, uh, obviously the technical specifications, anything that Daniel and the team at Omega had worked on was already well underway, but Got some it. of the kind of more superficial decisions mm -hmm. were still to be left. But there were um, ver there were like two, maybe three max options of things, and so I would have those things too in a fitting like that. If you know I'm 
basically me and the team are the kind of anything you want to try on like we're the we're the ones who get that time with Daniel so I would make sure that in my to-do list okay mm -hmm. we've got to deal with like finalizing the things for you know the Globetrotter suitcase or the Omega watch or right. whatever um, I remember one funny little story about that is I can't remember where where we were going but basically there were two watches and they were not obviously they'd only it was it's you're wearing one mm -hmm. but you know the ones that are in the film they're on the timeline they I think they had managed to do two or three total because of how long it takes to make them. sure and we needed to shoot them in a like it was one of our locations I honestly can't remember but you're not gonna pack it in your suitcase you're not gonna you know so I remembered uh, Michael Mooney and myself both wearing one. Michael had two. Oh my gosh. And, and we just, you know, there's that moment at airport security where you have to take off all your things and put it mm -hmm. in the tray. We were both like, we had a whole plan for like, you know, how we were going to place ourselves so that one person goes to the x-ray machine and just be able to look through the stuff coming through to make sure that it didn't get touched that it get, you know oh <laughs> it was like it was gosh. like carrying it's almost such like when precious people cargo. shackle you know yeah, cases to yeah, them and things exactly. like that diamonds and yeah, things yeah. you know and then every while we were on the plane i remember every few seconds just looking to make sure it was still on my wrist <laughs> gosh yeah that could be nerve-wracking you're right i mean so to your point this had the milanese strap it had the nato strap allegedly there was a rubber strap made so all these alternatives and then the final ones make the cut exactly so I'd like to do something with you, I, and I want to just preface everybody um, out there that this has been years since Sidorat actually chose these and curated this, but I did bring a bag. Um, the, uh, first of all, the bag itself may look familiar to you because yes. it's the one that Paloma yes. holds up. It's the Bennett and Winch. Yeah. Was this a, is this something that your department chooses? Is it the prop department? Um, it's a combo. And what basically, um, we, had, we have such a good relationship with the prop department. At the beginning of the film, we have a kind of prop costume crossover meeting mm. where there are things where um, we know that in our search in the world for things, we might come across things that are technically props but have so much to do with the look um, if I'm not mistaken, I actually, I think I remember the day that I saw these, um, and I don't even know that the scene had been written yet where she... Right, uh, with the tuxedo. Yeah, exactly, but I clocked that, and it might have been on the list that you might need, like, a... It, it might have been in my brain, or our collective brain, for what he might leave um, Jamaica with, or mm. something, as leaving meaning to carry a few things right right, right. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken I saw that out of the corner of my eye I made a note of it our buyer Jane or maybe it was Allison from our t buying team um, had a contact with the store that was selling that and they very graciously gave us the, the connection right. um, so when that scene was written I f I feel like the way it, and I Forgive me, I could be complete. I don't think I'm making this no, up. No, this is great. I have a memory of when we knew that he needed to have, um, the, the, the tux needed to be uh, revealed in that way. Yeah. Um, I believe it was Michael who remembered that there was this attachment to that because he's such a, he's, he loves gear and he loves like, oh, it's amazing. Really ama like he loves cargo pants because he loves the specific, like when we did the combat trousers, he was so into like the function of every pocket right. and like, uh, so he, I think he clocked that and he was like, oh, it could be that, you know. So, and anyways, we might provide a few options and mm -hmm. give it to, over to the prop department and say, we found these things. Are you cool if we show them in the fitting? Is there anything you want us to show Daniel in the fitting? Can you be in the fitting with the things you need? Like sometimes right. we'd have the armor in there to talk through the weapons. And that way, every department that had something to do with each other could do their work in a kind of uniform way like so with those tra keep going back to the trousers because that yeah. really was like we needed to know how the weapons were going to be drawn we needed to how to know how big the weapons were going to be mm -hmm. and so that way daniel whose time is very stretched you know 
he can have one conversation where everybody's hearing the same thing yeah. and Seamless. we're all working towards a goal. So in this, in a similar way, um, that would happen with Rob's. I yeah. love that story. And, and yeah, I mean, this is the type of partnership and communication you were talking about. But I have filled up this bag, <laughs> and I know it's been a while, but um, obviously here we've got the... Uh, yeah. Connolly jacket yeah. from Matera, and we've got the Anderson and Shepard yeah. linen top, which some people finally noticed that this is also Madeline's nightshirt that she wears. Yeah, well, that was very on purpose. <laughs> I would imagine. Yes. That was fantastic. So is, was this about the whole, we have to create romance? Because it is a different type of jacket for James Bond. Yeah, no, I, I yes, absolutely. I always knew that for that driving scene, driving those windy streets, I kind of, you know, before we enter Matera, I wanted to telegraph, you know, when they're in the car having that conversation, I wanted to telegraph that they're on vacation, like that they're, they're not going back into London, he's not like imminently going back to work, she's not imminently going back, like that this is like relaxed, and so literally wanted the silhouette to feel relaxed like not just as an adjective for the visual but like the structure was relaxed so yes. there's you know this jacket is a very relaxed jacket it's super relaxed it's and, like uh, a blouse and, and uh you know there are certain shapes that i feel are really good on daniel that daniel in his life gravitates towards. when i went into Connolly, um the beautiful store off uh, Savile, mm. um, i saw this and there was only one and i just quickly asked if there was if there were more and I did, and I remember Michael and I kind of like staring at it for a while, and then I didn't, I, I don't even, I don't remember the order of things, but I just, I loved it so much, I was like, I feel like we should have one, there's not really, we didn't, I don't think that scene was finalized yet, but, um, but when we knew we had that scene, it felt like a really, really good contender, so I, I brought it out for that fitting, right. you know. Um, and it still has, I, I think it still has a lot of the colors, that Bond yeah. would wear, you know, kind of that gravitating yeah. to the kind of the military blue. And then we have, because we have to represent uh, the Bond women as well, yeah. this was, of course, Madeline's outfit from the same scene. Yes. Which she pulls up. That's right. And Again, I found this. The romance and yeah, romantic yeah. and just a very simple dress. Yeah. Uh, youthful, but also traditional at the same time. Yeah. And again, it's sort of like that vision of, um, you know, postcard Italian romantic holiday right so just red is such a I mean it's love it's a heart it's life it's vitality it's you know and we just seen Madeline in the last film in very quite cold colors yes you know so to kind of break through the first frames of the film with this sort of burst of life and hope and vitality so that on her journey in the film we can drain all of that out again Ooh, you know that's the that. way to that's i always think of color in that way yeah yeah so there's an evolution of color because you're right inspector for example there's a lot of blacks whites very simple yeah. colorless and, and that's mostly i think i i have not you know had the conversation but my take on that was that um she's in her profession needing to telegraph a very professional you know, she, it can't really be about her, her clothes. I mean, she's obviously right. a stylish woman. She's a blonde woman. She's an incredibly glamorous human being. Yeah. But she also has to, you know, so much of that character and the love story is about breaking through the professional wall. So when we see at the end of that film that they've both taken this leap of faith, mm -hmm. to reintroduce them where it, we don't know how long the story has taken back, but they're right. clearly relaxed and in another place yeah. emotionally, mentally, psychically. And even the dialogue, the dialogue I think works with that, um, but things go wrong, and then you have Bond basically just get the shackles of anything Bond related, and he has this very simple gray, which I think he also has, uh, I think they're jet shorts, the blue athletic shorts that he wears. I don't, this. I don't, obvi I really don't remember the brand, to be honest. But the I, shorts, you had yeah. to do all the more brands, and I think you, you had to distress them, right? Yeah, we, it was basically, he's living a life of being a beach bum, basically, yeah. right? So he's just at, at leisure, doing his daily fishing, and 
you know, you wear your favorite thing to death, yeah. basically, right? But he, he still looks amazing in it because it's Daniel Craig and it's James Bond. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it was dressed down, but, and we've talked about this quite a bit, but I'm sure everybody's going to recognize this. This is, of course, the RGT yeah. jacket, which I would say in the Bond community, especially people that collect clothing, this has become one of the most sought after and obtained because it's not, and there's nothing wrong with the Tom Ford suits. I have a few, they're wonderful, but they're an investment. But Carl, who runs this company, made sure just because it's in Bond, he wasn't going to increase the price. It's in everybody's price range. It was kind of nice that people could actually yeah. obtain it. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it speaks for itself, right? It's such a great cut. And, yeah. yeah, and it, like, you know, I mean, for anybody who's not Tesha, it is an, it's an oiled cloth, mm -hmm. which was very specifically chosen because of its, where the story of where it might have gotten it. It, it should feel like one of clothing. Exactly. It's almost, it feels like armor. I remember when I first received that, it, it practically was standing up on its own. Um, as opposed to, we talked about this on the call, the trench coat. <laughs> you could see it in its size. Was this something that you had a lot of different alternatives before you? No, in fact, this was, I, this was, I picked this out and it had no place in the film and I just, it was, it's one, sometimes what happens is you see things and you're like, I don't know why, it's a left field thing, I always have a left field thing in a fitting, and he tried it on and loved it, and there was really no place for it in the film, and then when that scene was written, and we just thought, oh, he just needs to grab something for, like, it can't be too thought out, it's just like, the thing he grabs, that's what, why that ended up in the film. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I opened up, um, to my audience a question. I said that if you had one piece to question you about, what would it be? And I think it's because you see Daniel so much in it. And it's simple, but it is the rag and bone Henley, which we know Daniel Craig loves Henleys in real life. <laughs> but this is one that he wears with quite a few, I mean, obviously the trench coat, he wears it in the last outfit. Was this something that you said, all right, he's going to be in it a lot, or is it another situation where you don't Well, you, when you're breaking down the script, you see where the points of change might be, and literally, if I'm going to be very pedantic, the change from that, this look, into that final look, when you're on the run, you're thinking, like, he's not going to, there are certain things that you might just keep on, and he get, they get onto that military plane, and in his sort of kit, you might have, the cargo pants make sense because they have to hold the weapons, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. And, um, the jumper for the, loca the location, but like, if you're wearing your favorite t-shirt in human life, yeah, why like, would you take I've it off? worn the same, I mean like, you know, I've worn the same <laughs> shirt for days sometimes, you know, it's just so comfortable. And, yes. Like, if it functions, like, you know, I don't know if anybody's really going to want like, oh, I need a fresh shirt. I better yeah. change everything. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like, exactly. Like you just screen time and boredom and, Absolutely. you know, so it just, it just made sense to. And it really not. wasn't that much time. I think yeah. people think, oh, because there's been a few scenes. If you think about it in the chronological order of the actual story, yeah. it's, it's hours. Yeah. It's not exactly. that much time at no, all. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And of course, the Pièce de la Résistance, the uh, end peel, which I think the final one for the movie is a little bit slightly different than, which I imagine it would since it was tailored for him, different than the one that, the one that everybody can get. Yeah. yeah. But pretty bang Yeah, on. you know what, I've actually, I've not seen the, the one that you oh, can buy. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I've obviously spent a lot of time with the, the real one, but. See the yeah. tag? They're, they're so great. Uh, and Peel, Adam Holdsworth, and his team are so they're so great. They they did send me the combat trousers to look at before they went into the. Uh, but this one I think is a. I mean, there I have no doubt that this is faithful. Yeah, I mean it's <laughs> so, down to the I mean, patchworks yeah. and. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you how faithful it is. Many of us have actually, because this is what we do, we counted the ribs. Oh, right. The ribs are correct and right. everything like that. But it's just. It's a beautiful I mean, they piece. made the original, so they would know. Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. It's yeah. just wonderful. Do you, have, do you own a pair of their combat 
trousers that they uh, I do they yeah. offered yeah yeah they're fantastic yeah, yeah. well so, so that's a that's the difference is the combat trousers we made or our team made and then when and Peel was going to um, have this in their collection um, they asked also if they could, could have the combat trousers to to work off of. yeah exactly so so that's what I like that's probably why they sent me those to check yes yeah whereas this thing we'd already worked on that together this has been an incredible journey. Now, I have to ask a logical question because we, we just literally did a chronological run through. Does Bond feel like it's in the distant past? Does it feel like it happened yesterday? Is it sloughed off? Like you were saying, like some jobs, you know, come and go. Um, I mean, I, I feel like one of the things about Bond is it's kind of forever, you know? And, and also, I mean, just turning on the television the other day now, you know, no time to die is emblazoned across my, um, my options yes. yeah uh, so um, no it's it uh, it didn't it didn't sink away the thing maybe that I'm referring to when there's questions that I can't quite that aren't the answers are right on the tip of my tongue is more that after bond I did a couple other things so it's just the immediate d displacement that happens when you're so you know consumed by something and you know where every like every time I'm, I've seen it I remember I'm now at the point where I'm starting less to think about what it took to get each thing done and now I can actually watch it and enjoy it um, but you know for the first few sittings I'm like oh yeah this you know like you're, you're you can't help you're still in that you're mode still in the kind of giving yourself a mode. <laughs> and I did something so unfair to you in our last conversation I asked you all right what's that blue hat and you're like, I know it's not a fancy brand. So um, we did find out what the hat was. Oh, yeah. It's Carhartt. Oh, okay, yeah, so it was, yeah. Which makes sense, and I think the, the emblem was taken off. You can yeah. actually see the outline of it. And that was just crazy detectives online finding that out. Wonderful, well done. Just have to give it enough time, that's all you <laughs> yeah. have to do. There were a lot of blue hats in that fitting, I remember. <laughs> was yeah. there? Yeah. That was the final one? Yeah. So we have to ask a question about the future. What? Uh, can you mention any future projects you're working on? Um, no. I love that. <laughs> Sorry. You'll just have to wait, gosh yeah. darn it. Sorry. No, it's personal superstition and other things. But, Absolutely. Um, Contracts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like and some, yes. Yeah. Some legal heavy hours. Um, but, uh, yeah. No. Um, I will be busy, though. But I have no <laughs> doubt. Speaking of busy, thank you so much for taking time in your busy schedule yeah, for doing so this. Welcome. This has been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, no. So, uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> great. This is wonderful. And of course, this has been David Zaritsky for the Bond Experience, and we'll see you all real soon. Take care. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from the Bond Experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information, plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you, just because we know you. Talk to you soon.